It's amazing. She has an entrepreneurial spirit that's phenomenal. So she took that initial experience and morphed it into taking her own image in her own hand and building it up like um, into what it is today. In 1989, she started Al McPherson, which was a financial organization which then held her patents and intangibles and financing. And in 1990, she launched Al McPherson Infinite, which turned into a best-selling brand across Australia, the UK, and everywhere else. And then she didn't stop there. She expanded into other types of clothing and beauty aids, and finally into wellness. And in 2014, she co-founded Wellco and released its flagship product, the Super Elixir, a, a wellness supplement, which is sold at retailers all across the world. She has incredible entrepreneurial skills, and she is really personable. I know you're gonna love her as much as I do in the 45 minutes I got to meet her. Let me introduce Al McPherson. But also so great about Elle. I mean, she came all the way out here, obviously, just for this. And um, she's as prepared as anyone I've ever I've seen get prepared for this. So she really wants to have a dialogue with you. And I'm excited about that. Look at all the cameras going up. That's just, that's amazing. That's funny. Uh, Elle, thank you so much. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. And if, if I get tongue-tied here, will you help me do this? Because I, I might get a little nervous. But um, ah, this is going to be great. I'm That's why, uh, that's why I mm -hmm. had to take some notes along the way because I get really nervous. And I said to myself, it's so much better to, I, I can put my energy into being nervous or I can put my energy into preparing. So I decided I, I would put my energy into preparing. Well, that, that's great. It, listen, don't feel bad. A lot of people get nervous when they talk to me. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. You're, you're a good company. All right, so let's start with uh, your upbringing and your entrepreneurial father and, and how you got started and how you got interested in this all at the, at the outset. Mm. Well, I guess you could say that my uh, you know, my business spark comes from a variety of sources that you know inspire and motivate me in different ways. I um, My dad was definitely a significant influence in my life because he was an entrepreneur and because he... Um, he gave me structure and he gave me something to aspire to. But I think the most um, important influence was, you know, the, the desire and the willingness to see business as a journey. And when I talk about journey, I mean, you know, it's twists and turns and it's doubts and, you know, disappointments and it's um, successes and it's compromises. But I realized that if I can sort of see it, um, each experience as a point of reference on a journey, then I can put things into context, and then I don't fall apart if things don't happen the way I want them to happen. <laughs> um, and I also think that if I can see it as an unfolding journey, then I can allow magic into the creative mix. And you know what I mean by that is that sometimes I found in my business is that it's the illogical decisions that are often the, the best business decisions. You know, they're the things like. Um, just being in the right place at the right time or deciding that you're going to do business with somebody just because it feels right. And, uh, you know, and I believe that if you're open and aware, then you're less likely to shut down and you're more likely to stay connected to what you're trying to achieve. So seeing business as a journey and, and, and being open to opportunity and potential has been a really um, major force, I guess, in my career. That's amazing. So, but it still is courage to come across the ocean come to the United States on your own and start to earn money. Did you get any skills from your father or anything that helped you prepare for that? Or? Yeah, well, my dad, he was an interesting guy. I mean, he, he was a sound engineer and he used to fix uh, TVs in schools and um, audio equipment. And I think he was, he was quite smart because he realized that actually he would do better if he could supply the equipment as well as fix it. Um, and sometimes I even wondered if he didn't deliberately not fix it. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. He set up a he set up a, a, a hi-fi store in a you know in a little shopping center and then he uh, grew that hi-fi store to a string of hi-fi stores and then you know he, he had this thing that all the men in his life had died at fifty. So his father died at fifty, his grandfather died at fifty, so he had in his mind he was gonna die at fifty. So he would retire at 40. And he, I mean, can you imagine that, retiring at 40? I mean, it just seems like so bizarre today. But anyway, so he retired at 40 and said, I've got 10 years, I'm going to live the fruits of my labor. And, um, but he didn't die. <laughs> so he's 75 now. And he's still trying to live the off the money, money. <laughs> the money that he earned when he was like a young man. And so, 
you know, he had to sort of adapt and, and you know, he, he survived and, and he thrived. And, you know, like my dad, I think being a, a, adaptable or being willing to adapt is very important. And, and also, you know, just being aware of the situation so that you can capitalize on the flow of change. That's, well, that's a great story. And at least it's been family for a minute, uh, Al, because I was touched. I mean, we, you know, we were talking backstage about your sons. And uh, you've been an incredible hands-on and active mother um, with an incredible career. Not easy to do. Share a little bit about your sons and how you manage and how that works through and how you're able to do that. Yeah, well, it is a careful balance. Um, you know, parenting for me is just the gift that keeps on giving. And yes, it has been challenging at times, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can honestly say that it's given me so much joy that I've persisted in, you know, taking time and making space to dedicate to family because, you know, this is just, it gives me such joy. And um, somebody once said to me when I was younger, you know, the, the best thing you can give your children is your time. And that really resonated with me. And so, you know, that's what I, I decided to do. So, you know, we work together as a family and uh, we, we have our family calendar and we put all the key events in it and, you know, um, Christmas and birthdays, graduation, sporting events, dates, uh, <laughs> having two boys, that's high on the list. Uh, we celebrate milestones and um, we are a flight friendly family. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> we love to we love to travel, and um, but I can honestly say that simplicity has fought the best times for us. And you know, one time we did an RV trip around America camping. And the boys were much younger, but I can say that it was just so simple and enlightening, and it and it really brought us to, uh, together as a family. I mean, the boys are grown up now. Flynn is twenty. He's an entrepreneur. Um, so he's in entrepreneurial school in Boston. And uh, he is, uh, he's just finished a sort of watchmaking course. And I uh, get this, he just told me yesterday, we, I mentioned backstage that he's a, he's a pilot, and he got his pilot's license when he was 16, and then he, he decided that now he, he, he wants to do aerobatics. So that is acrobatics in the air, right? With play. How do you feel about that? Well, um, his point. <laughs> Uh, his point was, Mom, there is less accidents in the sky than there are with drunk driving. And I was like, okay, maybe you've got a point there. Uh, so anyway, that's what he's doing. And uh, my 15-year-old is, um, is at school. He's, um, he uh, has just finished his freshman in high school in, in Miami, and he's back in Australia. Now, we call it uh, doing agricultural business. It's actually just hard labor. He's a <laughs> shoveling horse poo. And, uh, but you know, as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, being willing to learn um, is really important to me. And, you know, and it's a value I still instill in my children, along with being open to new things. And you know, I, for me, it's sort of the beginning of the business career, so I really want them to experiment and to try lots of new things. And you know, they can do this through different ways and having quirky, you know, jobs or, um, you know, explore unconventional things because, you know, soon enough they're going to have to settle down and both boys are committed to their education, but, you know, if they decide that they're going to um, go off on a more unconventional route, I don't think I'd be upset or unhappy because um, I just want them to be happy and, you know, if their early business experiments don't work out, well, then they've got a solid education to back up any other job they want to do. So. That's true. And, and remember, I mean, they're, the apple's not falling far from the tree. I'm sure your parents wondered when you decided to leave law school and go to the United States to start modeling what that was going to be like. So uh, I'm sure they said the same thing you're saying. I yeah. hope it works out. Uh, but let's take, take us to that point. You come to the United States, 1980s. Right. And uh, you are here. And all of a sudden, I'm sure it seems to us like overnight, for you, I'm sure it's a lot of work, you become a brand. You're personally a brand, literally, uh, everywhere, all the time, every major cover of everything, one of the supermodels. And yet you said, and so you're on top of your game, you're really young, like your father, I don't know if you're thinking, what, God, you had to get a lot done early. But then you say, okay, this is great, I'm really happy being a supermodel, but I want to do more and something different. And I want to try a different path as well. Mm. What were you thinking at that time, and how did you start going in that direction? 
it's true, my business was going from strength to strength. But you know, like with any journey, I think it's really important that you're not going so fast that you don't recognize when you come to a crossroad. And for me, uh, that crossroad uh, came in 1989 where I did have that feeling that I wanted to do more. And it sort of uh, corresponded with the time where I uh, came into contact with this uh, young uh, New Zealand lingerie company who wanted to break into the Australian market and they needed a recognizable name and face. And, uh, I wanted to do different things and, um, you know, I sort of had this light bulb moment that perhaps I could license my name and brand to them and, you know, maybe we could build a business together and I thought, look, my Sports Illustrated background and my love of lingerie and their, <laughs> uh, and their love of lingerie, <laughs> that, you know, we could do a business together. But, you know, it, 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 it presented me with a crossroads because, um, my modeling agency at the time didn't know how to handle a license, and they couldn't really take me uh, the step forward that I might to take, and I wasn't willing to stop learning, and I didn't want to be restricted into existing um, business structures and methods, and I could feel momentum <coughs> growing, and I had to make a decision, and uh, so I, I thought to myself, I can either like drive straight through this crossroads and you know continue doing the same thing um, maybe a little bit differently with my agency but basically do the same thing or i could stop and and maybe look left and right and turn down a new road that had no signposts um, to follow so i you know i paused and i um i uh sense you know got a sense of my options and you know figured out what i was drawn to and i decided to go down a different road that i knew nothing about, but I just felt was right for me, and then I set up Elm Curtin Inc., which then went on to license, um, you know, look after the license that I was presented with, and, um, you know, help me um, really grow my dreams in the industry. And yeah, it meant the security of the modeling agency, but it gave me, um, I was able to then take command of my uh, business at a very important time in my life, and I was able to sort of invest into my image and its business potential. And I trusted my heart. Uh, you know, I followed an a, a uncertain opportunity because I, I really had no idea what I was doing along this way, but I just felt illogically drawn to it. And um, I'm a great believer that you need to speculate to accumulate, and that's what I did. And I just. From that moment, it was just like I had my foot on the fast pedal of a, you know, stuck in accelerator, and you know, I think you reach a point in your career where it's uh, no longer just a progression, but it's an evolution, and um, and that's, you know, that's where I was. But it was super scary, and um, and I felt really out of control. But you know, that's all part of the illogical brilliance that makes magic happen. It's um, you know, it's like turning the impossible into the possible. And, yeah, it was a pretty incredible time. Undoubtedly, and it's what's really amazing, Al, is obviously you understood yourself and what drove you. You don't have a business degree. You never finished your law degree. No. And now you're managing your brand, which is your most important asset. It must have been a little intimidating. Or did you have anyone you relied on or, or worked with that helped you out through that? Well, I think, uh, you know, I mean, now with Welco, I've been working very closely with my CEO and you know we have a fantastic business partnership together and you know with any business partnership I think you have strengths and weaknesses and I think a successful business partnership really uh, depends on you recognizing, respecting and um, and enabling each other's strengths for the good of the business uh, and you know working together diligently and caringly to develop your own sort of individual um, roles and responsibilities and while you're still to play the end. So it's, it's quite a, 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 a big role and, and Andrew has been a huge mentor for me. I, mean, I believe if, if people show in the business shines and in my case Andrea who has really helped uh, well call as a brand, I think she's been a fantastic CEO. Strong, she's practical, she's resourceful, she gets things done. She comes from a beauty background, as we, uh, you know, as, as you may or know, with Invisible Zinc. And uh, she has a publishing background. And, you know, I acknowledge her, uh, you know, I, I, I help her stand true to her convictions. And I, and I sort of um, acknowledge her, you know, 
a capacity for team leadership. And and then you know she's helped me with I, to understand my strengths. Yeah, I'm sure you've helped her a lot too. So that's a good partnership as well. Yeah. So with, with Peggy Johnson, I know you said this morning as well. We talked about inflections in her life. How she went from engineering to business to Qualcomm to Microsoft. You now have gone through a couple inflections. You started off modeling, mm -hmm. then you get into clothing, you start your own company, then you get to Wellco, and now it's really successful, Wellco as a company. Mm -hmm. And what were your initial insights? And, and tell us a little bit about Wellco and what you're doing. Yeah, well, for my part, I mean, things have to really resonate with me to capture my attention. And, you know, I was really captivated by the idea of merging um, wellness and beauty. And, uh, and I had seen a very clear delineation when I was younger that, you know, youth and beauty went together. But as I matured, I really noticed that wellness and beauty went together. And this was really evident for me when I turned 50. And because I can tell you why, because I was not looking very well and I was not feeling very well. And so I, um, I went to see a nutritionist and I said to her, something's wrong, <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> And she put me on a plant-based diet, and then she sort of said, you know, take this multivitamin, mineral, alkalizing greens, um, a probiotic, prebiotic green powder, and uh, get back to me. And so we tweaked the recipe together, uh, the nutritionist and I, and sort of made it tailor-made for me. And um, uh, then I uh, was working with Andrew, and she said to, and I've been taking it quite consistently, like two or three months, and she'd said to me, you know, you're, um, you're looking amazing, and you're, you're you so full of energy. Yeah. And I said, I feel amazing. And and she said, and I said, and I really love to share this with other women. She said, let's start a business. And I think that's a perfect example of how we kind of came together, because I had a problem, I found a solution, and I had a vision. But she had the CEO of Groundedness, and she pulled it together, and that's how, you know, work was born. And, I think you know Wellco's success really comes from us, uh, you know, from us delivering on our promise, which is you know it's quality and effective. I, I think other people are seeing the same things when we take the product, and you know we spend a lot of time sourcing the best raw materials and you know to make the best products and, and, and use the best methods to make those products. And so you know our customers are discerning. So I I, I think integrity is, has really been the key to the success of Wellco. Is that so? Uh, integrity key to success of Wellco. But what seems to be the success of your whole life has been, you know, managing your brand. Your brand from all these different endeavors and carrying it forward. Integrity is a big part of brand. What do you think about when you think of brand? How do you make decisions what you want to do in light of your brand? Mm, that's a good, that's a good uh, question, actually. I mean, my brand values are always evolving, and, you know, I'm always refining them. And they're, they're really grounded in my experience and my own personal truth and my personality and you know they're really part of me and you know the things that are important to me are and I, I say this to my children it's it's very important to, you know to love your business or to love what you do because if you love what you do and you do what you love um, then you never work another day in your life and I think uh, as I mentioned earlier you know business is a journey and if you can see it as a journey then you're able to evolve and adapt to whatever circumstances or whatever opportunities come to you. Um, I mentioned that quality is important. And to me, you know, you can never go wrong with true quality. And what that shows is that you're passionate about what you do and you care about the kind of products that you put on the market. And another one is simplicity. This is a big one for me because, um, you know, I've really noticed if you overcomplicate things, uh, you know, it costs money and it's time and it costs compromise. And, Simplicity has this incredible way of just standing out from the crowd, and if you can keep your product simple, then you have sort of a, you can capture people's imagination, and you have a clear voice and a clear purpose and and integrity. You can ask yourself, you know, does this resonate with me? Is it, you know, is it will this resonate with my customer? And, and last but really not least, I think being open, you know, openness, open heart, open mind because you don't want to get stuck too much in logic and over planning because then the magic travels. It's remarkable because you make it sound so easy, right? So, <laughs> you know, it, and it's like... Yeah, it took me 40 years. <laughs> well, but it's like, it, you know, you start with Ellen as you personally and then 
you start to sell a product, which isn't easy. And then now you're into a wellness uh, solution that you came together. And that's a whole other way to expand. And mm -hmm. now, and we've talked about this, I want you to share with the audience a little bit. That's the old way of doing things, and now you've got the internet and mm -hmm. social media. So even though you figured out how to operate all these different things in the old world, you're still kind of like everybody else yeah. and trying to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And so you started to think about social media and, and how you take the, that forward. Tell us a little bit about what you're thinking here. Yeah, well, it's very interesting with social media. I mean, it really depends on your message and your business backdrop. But, you know, for example, with Wellco, we are a very visual brand. And so we rely heavily on Instagram, thank God for Instagram, and, um, and uh, Facebook and our, you know, weekly EDMs. And, you know, we, we aim to use images that uh, link beauty to what you ingest. And so, you know, our message is really beautiful from the inside out. And I think we actually have a video. Yeah, I'm so excited that. you brought it in. Can you, you roll the <laughs> short video? Flexibility and self-discipline, and perseverance, and uh, but I think it's a vital attitude. And you know, things have really changed though since when I was a model in the 80s. Because in the 80s, the the greater the distance you had between you and your public, the more iconic you were, the more successful you were. But um, today, you know, it's a really different story because with the advent of social media and the internet, the more connected you are to your public the more successful you are. And, you know, we see this as particularly clear with our uh, work because we are a predominantly online business and we found that, you know, because you have to speak directly to your customer in informed, in intelligent ways um, to, to, to speak of your brand. And, you know, our tribe then go on and, and speak to each other. And, you know, we could never have done this um, years ago. So, you know, it, it is a really potent opportunity at the moment if you're willing to adapt. Interesting, and so much adaption, and I want to go back and see the movement from all these things through your life. Again, it looks seamless, it looks easy, but or not, you know that. Certainly entrepreneurs in the room know that. But you said, and like Peggy did, you make a lot of decisions about instinct. Mm -hmm. You follow your gut. Talk about that. How do you yeah. trust that? Well, I think in a sense, that's that in a sense is it, it's at least as important, if not more important, than common sense. And when I say in a sense, I mean sort of like your heart or your gut. It's the same thing, a different label, and obviously your common sense is your head. But I also think that uh, you know motivation and inspiration are really important. And some people think they're interchangeable, but I don't because I think you know motivation is really about movement. It's action oriented. It's you know, when you get fired up to produce uh, something that you really feel strongly about. And yet, inspiration is very different. It's, you know, it's that quiet place of being and, and where you allow for sort of a download of ideas. And, you know, I think just in this busy world, it's so important to connect with what's important to you, um, which, you know, which really resonates with you personally. And I don't know, some people do it through meditation, uh, I do, and some people do it through, you know, working out or listening to music or a walk on the beach. I, I think yoga is very important for me, but, you know, it's it's vital for inspiration to bloom, um, to have that still time. And I've been guided by both inspiration and motivation, where they're key to business, so, you know, they, they give the business energy, it's important for longevity, 
I think that they sort of go hand in hand. It's almost like a fly motivation to inspiration. And um, somebody once said to me, and it was a fantastic piece of advice, it really changed the way I started doing things. They said to me, let your heart decide what to do and let your head then figure out how to do it. And I really loved that. And there was a quote by Albert Einstein that said, you know, imagination is much more important than um, knowledge. And so these are sort of things that have guided me throughout my journey. Wow, that's, that's very, very interesting. And we should kind of kind of like that. Yeah. Um, so, but when you go by instinct and you go by imagination, it doesn't always work out in your head the way it's supposed to in your heart. And so there must be some challenge. Something must have happened along the way. Share something to let us know you're human. Like something uh, that you've well, also had some issues. So many, there have been a lot of challenges along the way. And it really depends on sort of your, you know, evolution and context. I, I think, uh, the biggest thing that has been, uh, if I had to name you know, one challenge, I, I think it's when the outside world becomes so demanding and I become so over-focused on what I'm supposed to be doing that I lose sight of myself, you know. I lose my self-confidence, I lose, I, I don't even know who I am anymore. And that, uh, you know, finding stillness when you're trying to wear so many hats has been a really big challenge for me and it's, um, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting time. <laughs> well, so, all right, so you have this great idea, you hit these challenges, you recognize whenever you make a decision, there's risks involved, right. and, and, and you have to, with your head, then manage those risks. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with the risk? How do you deal with those issues that come up that you didn't anticipate? Well, risk for me is, it's like my big motto is face it and embrace it. That's what I say to the boys all the time. Whatever comes up, just face it and embrace it. And, you know, I see risk as an opportunity. I don't see it as a sort of necessary evil. Um, you know, and I've really learned to embrace my own um, business journey and all the risks. And even the things that could be perceived as failures. And you, you mentioned it before, like tell me something. You know, for me, I, I don't really see um, failures. I see failures as opportunities to learn. Um, and, and they're actually vital to learning. Um, actually, I think the only real failure is, is refusing to learn. And for me, you know, I don't really see risk as a two-sided coin with like success on one side and failure on the other. I mean, for me, it's much more unified. And you know, sometimes the return on the risk is profit, and sometimes the return on the risk is risk is wisdom, and sometimes. And it's when it's really the best is when it's a combination of both. And, you know, I have seen a lot of people turn um, failures into regrets and then they spend their days thinking, oh, I wish I'd done it differently. Instead of sort of saying, okay, and, and I've had to go through this myself, that's why I can talk about it. You know, I've, I've had to sort of look at things and go, okay, how can I learn from this? What did, you know, how can I understand it? And then move on from there. And, you know, what I found is that the wisdom you walk away with is invaluable and often can only be learned through experience. Uh, that's that's uh, good insights. And, and I, I would say, you know, if you listen to that, and, and obviously you must have had risks, and it's not evident to everybody to work through them. You've spent a lot of time in your career, you talked about your family and your, how important they are to you, yet you still find time or um, be one of the most philanthropic people that's out there um, with UNICEF and what you do with all the different projects you work on. How do you, how do you choose what you want to do there? Talk about, I mean, you feel really important. You've been lucky in life and you want to give back. And talk about what that means to you. Yeah, I mean, it's about resonance, isn't it? And I spoke a little bit earlier about resonance in business, but uh, I think it's the same thing for charity. You know, you, you, you know, things have to really resonate deeply for me and they have to be a good fit. And so, I choose charities that um, you know that touch my heart and in some way, or they resonate with my values. And I just recently I went to Texas and I spoke to this uh, group of people. They're incredible. They've set up this initiative called I Am Waters, and um, it's an in initiative that provides um, clean drinking water for homeless people in America. And their goal is to enrich people's lives through providing this clean drinking bottle of water daily. And on the bottled water is um, words of inspiration. So, you know, one bottle will have love on it, and the other one will have hope, and the other one will have dream on it. And I just thought that was such a simple and yet effective way to sort of inspire and hydrate and, you know, help solve a problem at the same time. 
And then they moved on, and then now they have this I Am Jobs, jobs program. And the I Am Jobs program is uh, helping uh, people to get into the working society. So then they have accommodation. So then they have clean drinking water, because they can't get clean drink drinking water. Uh, the way they get clean drinking water is through accommodation, because there's no fountains in the streets anymore. So it's sort of this circular thing. And, they believe in a sort of a hand up instead of a hand out, and that is something that I really strongly believe in. So, you know, when you find a synergy with a, with a, with a charity or initiative, that's when I feel like I can, that's when I'm happiest. No, it's, it's, uh, I don't know how you find the time for all of it. Uh, but with that being said, you've hit some prep, uh, major pivots in your life, a lot of different mm -hmm. directions, and I guess a good question is, is there another uh, sprint in the last quarter mile here? And what, what's next for you? Uh, listen, I'll give anything a go. I'm one of those girls, very healthy, <laughs> give it a go, girl. Um, but I, um, I don't know, you know, I have this thing that I say, I'm sort of saying, listen, what you think, what you feel, you make real. And so you better think about what you want and instead of what you don't want. And I also think it's really important that you invest in the now and that I invest in the now. Um, because my now creates the future. And in that sense, my whole life I've noticed that when I put my energy into what I'm doing now, that is the next step to my future. And so, you know, for me, my now is my children and, and Welco, being here with you guys. Um, and so, you know, that's where I'm at. That's awesome. Well, let me ask you, when I ask this of everyone in the interview, because you have done so many things and you've been so successful, um, what advice do you have to the entrepreneurs out here as they make pivots in their career, as they take risks and meet the challenges that you're talking about, as they protect their brand and do all the things that you've done, what have you learned that you can share with them? And what other messages might you have to any of our uh, people out here? Okay, well I think willingness to learn is a huge importance. You know, just having the courage and the willingness to learn along your journey. And you know, I sometimes think that uh, business is like a long-term marriage. Um, I've had three of them, <laughs> actually not marriages, but three long-term relationships. Uh, and I, you know what, it, it's, it's like, you know, it, it's about adaptation, uh, you know, there's lots of adaptation and there's lots, of, you know, along the way there's lots of long-term benefits. And somebody once said to me, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And, you know, I think that's true in relationships, but I also think it's true in business. And, you know, it's very important that you, um, reconcile your arguments before you go to bed. And when I say arguments, it's, it could be the arguments in your own head, you know, that, that voice that tells you you gotta do things over and over again. I think having a very restful, peaceful sleep is extremely important and very underrated. And because I think you need to then you can wake up with love and hope and you can give life a go and see that every moment is just a doorway to infinite possibilities. And so they would be my words of wisdom. And I also want to say uh, congratulations to Christian uh, Beck, who is our Australian. Oh. <laughs> we'll do that at cocktail hour, okay? Um, so that's uh, it's great advice. I mean, one thing I didn't touch on, I just want to see because if it's in your plans at all, we didn't need to talk about, but you've been on television quite a bit too. You acted, you were right. friends. Um, one of favorites and really interesting friends is a show that people don't realize it's taken off around the world. I don't know if you've noticed it, but during the recent summit that they just had, Friends is now in North Korea. They have the North Korean yeah. Friends. Yeah, they're not, they're, it's not just the Friends that they brought over by however means they got it over there. It's actually Koreans who are Friends on television take it off on the show. And yeah, it's, it's wild. And, and, Anything in acting, or, or did you like that? Was it interesting? Are you doing further there? I loved working on Friends. I did that. I had a seven-episode arc, and uh, it was such a fantastic experience. I mean, I've been really blessed. I've worked with some incredible actors, Anthony Hopkins, um, uh, George Clooney. I kissed George Clooney. How about that? Um, I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> I did interview a Mal Clooney right at that time. She didn't kiss me, but I did interview her right there. Don't tell her I kissed her. She would be safe with all of us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you did, but any, any chance you might want to do that again? No, I really have my hands full doing what I'm doing. And I have you know, wonderful experiences acting and um, you know, uh, along the way. But today it's all about 
building a wellness brand and helping other women, um, you know, to through the journey sort of that I've been through, which is a journey through wellness and and confidence through wellness. And um, yeah, that's that's where my focus is. Well, that's awesome. There's one thing I do want you to just do before we do end up here is I asked you to. Um, because all of us have seen pictures and images of you right. everywhere uh, all, for so many years throughout our whole lives. And it's probably hard to, I know you said, I asked you if you saw the, the interview you did. You did an interview on CNBC yeah. this morning and you said, no, I don't like to watch myself. I don't do it. A lot of people do like to watch you. That's a good thing. <laughs> but what is your favorite image of yourself? I asked you to identify and try and bring it here. I don't, could we, could we get I it have, up there? I, I, I talk about somebody it? Has yeah. put it up. Do we have the image? There it is. <laughs> okay, so I love Not what I expected, but this is all right. Yeah. <laughs> I love this image because, um, okay, so this is for Elle magazine. It was shot by my then husband, one of the three, uh, <laughs> the first one, uh, who's a photographer, and I was very, I really wanted a cover of Elle. I had only had one cover, and my name was Elle, and I'm looking at the cover of Elle, and he was a photographer from, from Elle, and he didn't want to put me on the cover because he didn't want people to think he was favoritizing me, whatever. But anyway, I knew this was a cover show, and as we're just about to shoot it, he comes up and he gets these green fluorescent things, he puts it on my eyes, and he says, I want to make you like a zephyr, like, <laughs> like an Uzi zephyr. And I'm like, Jill, this is terrible. This is really bad. This is, one never, to be on the cover. this is never gonna get on the cover. This is terrible. And I get so upset with him that I start crying. And actually, you can see, I think you can see in the eyes that my eyes are red. And I, and I just like, I can't believe you're doing this to me. And he goes, no, you know, you're like a warrior. You're like this woman warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Anyhow, so I do the shot, and I get into such a state, I'm so angry with him, that he can only get a couple of pictures. Anyway, they ended up using it on the cover. And I really like this image because Having put some thought into my journey and preparing for this, I realized that there is a courageous uh, woman inside me that has really been through quite a lot along the way and has had a, you know, is like a sort of goddess with God. It has, it has um, you know, had the, the willingness to learn and the willingness to take risks and the willingness to go on a journey and enjoy that journey along the way. And so I feel somehow that this image um, exemplifies it. I think it's great. It's great. It's one of the top hundred I've seen. Yeah, I think it's right up <laughs> So um, I've unfortunately been uh, selfish in, in taking up all your time. Um, but what, what's great about Elle, and I'm going to tell you, and hopefully you've seen it, first of all, it's so sweet. I mean, Elle said, I just really want, I really respect entrepreneurs. I really yeah. want to do a great job. I want to be out here. I'm going to get prepared. And it's been a tremendous getting to know you and, and opening up to us. And, and we can't thank you enough for that. It is an inspirational story. While I, why I, I, while I have taken up the time, and so we won't do Q&A now, Ellen's going to be with us. Um, one of the few people who do come to this, she's going to be with us tonight and tomorrow night. And um, so I find you incredibly personal. I know everybody else will too. So you'll have opportunities to spend some time with her and, and get to know her and really uh, understand who she is beyond the, the picture. So, big hand of applause for Elvis.